Back. Can people hear me? All PT. right. Sweet. For Haskell, there's a library called LMS Verify to use higher level code for writing fast low level code, C like code. Is there something similar for Haskell that we can use for Haskell for low level programming? Um, I don't know. Um, there, there is, in some sense, there was a project called Atom. Let me go back to the chat here so I can see it. Um, which was used to build these little deterministic state machines and compile down to like efficient C code for running on embedded systems. Um, that's probably the closest thing that I can really think of. And then there's a bunch of other projects like BlueSpec, which is basically using Haskell, which was using Haskell as a like sort of macro programming language for like spit, spitting out system Verilog. Um, so there's been a bunch of stuff like that. Yeah, if you look on, um, let's see if I can pull this up. Package Haskell. Package. Adam. Adam is an EDSL for embedded hard real-time applications. And then, like, there's others, like, there's several other things that people have done, like, not for, like, reasoning about spitting out C, but, like, if you look at Accelerate and things like that, um, I, I think uh, there was a series of blog posts by Matt Farr very recently. On his blog about the history of the Intel SPMD program compiler. And in there, he made a comment about how um, everything the Intel team had been talking about for optimizations was a, uh, I'm trying to, I'm blanking on the terminology that he used. He said, like, it was whether, whether it was like an actual, like a, a model or an optimization, right? Like you can reason within a model, but optimizations are kind of catch as catch can. And like, if I look at a lot of the stuff that's been done in Haskell, like we've got all this stuff with vector where we have stream fusion and we have all this stuff with text and um, uh, accelerate and all these things uh, implement a series of optimizations that we hope benefit you rather than a model in which you can guarantee you get benefits. Um, and so one of the things that I would really like to see more of in Haskell would be a, like a little embedded domain specific language for describing the kind of SPMD on SIMD programs that I like to work with and stuff like that, like being able to package that up. I will have to look at that LMS paper. I have not, I've not actually read that or looked at the library. Um, so yeah, that, that's the the idea of something like Adam using Haskell as like a macro programming language to spit out the code that I want to run is something that I've used a fair bit. Like my first little foray, into, my most recent foray into playing around with uh, graphics for ray tracing was basically building ha a Haskell based EDSL for generating all the shaders and stuff that I wanted to work with. That was the last time I touched all of the crazy probability theory stuff that we were talking about earlier. Oak Minch computation monad. Let me. The accelerator or something gets similar, close to helpful there. Um, I still find. Um, I uh, and I, I really feel bad about this because I, I um, I'm actually helping to mentor a GSOC student this year who's um, doing automatic differentiation through Accelerate. I have yet to really effectively be able to leverage Accelerate for almost any of my GPU programming needs, which really makes me sad. Um, and it, 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 I think it's a failing of me, not of Accelerate necessarily. Um, so I'm not the best person to cop, uh, comment there. But I do think, uh, to me, Accelerate seems like it falls into that, here's a suite of optimizations or a, you know, a domain-specific language of things that sometimes work template-wise, right? Whereas the SPMD, et cetera, approach seems to feel more like a thing that I can, I can go to the bank with.
fair BT stream computations by that. What's this go? Uh, fair BT stream. Simple and fair. What was the question? For counting back traffic, backtracking steps. Was the, uh, that was probably an old comment. Yes, it's half an hour old. Never mind. What about Kamal Elliott's compiling to categories with regards to fast low level code? Um, I'm actually really surprised at how well uh, Connell's stuff for compiling down to like like fairly simple CCCs from GHC as a plugin. Um, I'm really surprised at how well that works. Um, uh, very pleasantly surprised. Um, as a technique for writing fast low-level code, I don't know. Um, it, it's great as long as you can get your stuff to fit into it. I mean, I think it's really kind of neat that you can turn around and express um, like things like AD as code transformation. Oh, yeah. Uh, hi, Alec. Uh, and thanks. Uh, sorry, I didn't notice a comment. Yo. Long time no see. I should like hang out with you sometime. I'm still in the Boston area. I'm over in Watertown now. Haskell Mort. Uh, what is Mort? Is that one of those games? Thank you, sorry, my. I'm thinking of something else. I don't, I, I don't catch the reference, I'm sorry. Bare bones calculus constructions. Got it. Oh, Gabriel's thing. Got it. Are you asking for my opinions on it? Or, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite catching the, the goal of the question. I don't have much of an opinion on it. I haven't used it. It's uh, kind of it's it, it, it's often its own little silo and fairly researchy. And I have my own often own my own little silo, little researchy projects, and yeah. I mean. Gabriel's a pretty smart dude. I'm pretty sure there's something there. I just don't know enough about it to comment. Uh, yeah, uh, whole program super optimization is an interesting problem. Um, there was a, uh, uh, let's see, Neil Mitchell and uh, somebody else had a, like a couple of papers like right in a row at like the Haskell Implementers Workshop, like 2012-ish. I have to look back in the time where there was there was like this this like burst of energy uh, obsessing about using super compilation in Haskell and whatnot um, and like the approach taken by JHC and whatnot is really effective when it works it's it, it, in terms of shrinking code on the other hand it's also really effect, effective in blowing up code <laughs> so um it's one of the reasons why I like JIT so much is that the idea of using some kind of tracing JIT or something like that as a form of online super compilation um, is really promising to me. So yeah, I, I can't comment on Mort. I just don't know enough about what it's doing. Um, I 
F star is a language. It is not a language I'm uh, that I want to think in. Uh, that I understand why people would want. It. It's it's just I I only have so much attention to split between so many topics, and so I just I tend to I've kind of placed that in the eh, I'll deal with other things. Ben. More tools for pro proving programmers are, is always good. Um, the idea of handing off little parts of your type checker and stuff like that to C3, all that kind of stuff is good. Um, Yeah, I've, I've, um, the sort of space that um, F star seems to be stepping into, I like a lot of my attention in that area has been kind of sucked up by Lean. Mainly because I've long since learned ne never to bet against Leo Demura in terms of like how efficiently things can be implemented. Um, I don't know. I think we've got a, let me pull up a straw poll and see, uh, what the mix of old hands to new, new, <laughs> new Haskellers or whatever, new folks. is here let's uh, pull that up here and go to twitch and full screen to do switch the view I know everything Do sure. Create a poll. I'll dump this into chat. And why am I so red? Um, I think it's an artifact of the lighting here and trying to counterbalance the uh, um, thing and the fact that I got sunburned the other day. So I think it just wound up that way because of the counterbalance of the green screen. But there's a lot of light in this room. <laughs> So we seem to have lost the, like last time we were probably like 60-40 split. And um, we're definitely more Haskellers so far. Although I guess this is still coming in, so we'll see. Yeah, I, I guess it, me clicking the I know some things pretty much put a ceiling on what a lot of people want to put it, want to click. Yeah, so we, 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 we seem to have lost a uh, significant portion of the, hey, I'm curious about Haskell audience that we had last time. Um, or we might have just lost them by this point in the stream after I kick-started off by rambling on about marginal distributions and probability theory.
We have one, what is Haskell, which I'm guessing is either sincere or a troll, which is indistinguishable. All right, closing that down. All right. Other questions, or am I just going to dive off into code somewhere? Uh, was the viewer count uh, about the same when I had new uh, The first session we had, we had about 130 to 150 people most of the time. We have about 90 this time. I know that representable and distributive are strongly related. Why are they separate type classes? Um, originally, the idea was that the distributive package was the everything I could say that was completely like Haskell uh, 98, Haskell 2010. Uh, anything that didn't require language extensions. So the distributive package is a very lightweight package that has no dependencies really, and so it's easier for me to get people to depend on it. The um, adjunctions package that supplies representable, on the other hand, because of, in some sense, the historical uh, quirks of, of the situation, I have all of my packages and then that thing sits atop, the, the, like as a crown, pretty high, that, pretty high near the top. Um, and so it's a much heavier weight dependency. It's almost impossible to get people to depend on it. Um, now there's some work that Aaron Vargo has been throwing at me to improve the code for representable to make it more efficient. And that's making me want to change distributive to make distributive more efficient. And so I think we're going to wind up having to pull more of the representable code up into distributive or we're going to have to um, accept the fact that distributive something needs to do, something needs to give here. Um, the, uh, the general idea was that representable used type families and could tell you which, what the type family was that you could, that was the logarithm of your data type, whereas distributive just gave you, just gave you the knowledge that it existed without actually telling you what it was. Yeah, I think we probably um, just didn't have the like 30 or 40 of the of the of the newer folks that kind of showed up last time. It seems to be about where the 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 I think it's more lost than additional old hand showing up. Uh, what do I think about Lean? I think Lean has a lot of really good ideas in it. Um, I like one of the things that I really like on a personal level is I like all this stuff on homotopy type theory, which Lean is unfortunately. Uh, has doubled down on a on the sort of axiom K side of the fence, and so it lean is incompatible with homotopy type theory at this point, and um, so that makes me sad. On the other hand, all of the work that uh, Leo and those folks have been doing on um, congruence closure and and whatnot, like porting all these algorithms out of the SMT world and having them work in a dependent type setting, are, is amazing. Like the, like the heterogeneous uh, stuff for congruence closure there is, is really really slick. The first session, the SWH, the one last time or the one before that? The one before that was just an audio test. Last session, I only gave it like probably 12 or 12 hours worth of notice. This one I was able to get like two days worth of notice, but I still have lower attendance. So I don't know. I don't know what the right ratio is or the right timing is. Nice to present things like uh, the free monad, free monad's effects. Do you want me to go through that or do you, uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get what you're going for? People are still doing hot with the older lean as well. I haven't seen the uh, the tool for checking to see that you haven't used Axiom K anywhere. But it's good to know. Yeah, um, I think what I'll probably wind up doing instead of going through them all today is at some point in the future do a... Um, almost like a talk rather than a Q and A session about effect systems. Cause I have like a, a rant that I've been meaning to give sort of like an MTL versus the world kind of rant going through classifying all the work on effect systems and stuff. And I, I gave a short spiel about it during the first unrecorded session here in response to a question. And I would like to just get that captured in a form that I can refer to later when people ask me the same question on the internet. Um, I, I do think that, uh, like, Connor has a point in some sense, which is that, you know, like, kind star 
um, kind of biased forward so that we're talking about uh, like the like the category of functions in Haskell is a fairly limited view. Um, th so that, that much is true. And the other thing is is that when you start talking about the category theory of Haskell, like the fact that we have lifted products and all this kind of stuff really makes the category theory of what we have a mess. So you have to you have to talk about several like idealizations of the notion of a category in Haskell. Simple 2D infinite Android game. What programming language should you learn? And should you learn Unity? Um, honestly, uh, Unity is a pretty good platform for getting games developed at this point. Um, it's it's really sad, but the it's gotten so difficult to write um, portable game code because the like the story of like how do you deal with shaders and all this kind of stuff. Um, I would almost I, I reached for Unity or for Unreal or something like that as a prototyping tool. Um, there's like uh, so I don't know what you mean by two D infinite um, Android game. Sorry, it's like are you like two D side scroller or something like that? I mean, one nice thing about like starting with something like Unity is you can then dive into the C sharp side. Are pure and return examples of the divide between category theory and how we represent in Hask? Um, I think, well, pure is um, return existing inside of monad is more a historical accident, right? It should be up in, in applicative or even further up. Um, but yeah, you can view return as a natural transformation from identity to M and then join as a natural transformation from compose MM to M. Um, you, it gets messy because things are not on the nose exactly because functor composition in Haskell isn't strict or whatever. When would I make a functional inlineable? Um, inlineable, um, I use whenever, how to put this, whenever... Whenever having access to the body of the function for the compiler could make a huge difference. Like an example would be like a lot of stuff in data.map should be inlineable because if it's if it has to uh, make choices based on the eek and the ord instance, um, if it wasn't inlineable, then it's going to like pass in a function. It's going to have to call an opaque function and do things, which means it's going to have to box and then box around it. Um, there's a library that uh, Dan Dole has uh, for vector algorithms, for instance. And around 7.4 or 7.6, there was a like a massive regression in the performance of GHC because it stopped inlining everything through that. And so um, even inlineable even wasn't, it wasn't even enough. We haven't quite recovered from it. Um, it's actually one of the projects that I might want to do here is sit down and try and do a version of vector algorithms that is backpacked. Um, I'll add that to my list of potential project ideas. So yeah, inlineable versus inline. Um, inline is saying GHC, please inline. In inlineable is saying GHC, um, make sure that the source code for this is available inside of the um, HI file and so that it is possible to inline. So you have it's giving GHC more flexibility. Um, inline tends to hit the compiler more. Um, would you make a difference in usage between arrows, pipes, conduits, and streams? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so, like pipes versus conduit 
is and like I, I'll, let me do pipes versus conduit versus say machines. Um, there's there's several things in this space, and um, I probably won't be able to cover all of them uh, in a quick answer. The um, so pipes being um, Gabriel's library and uh, conduits being the the take that Michael Snowman has the thing, and then machines is the one that I wrote, which was sort of a um, not quite a rebuttal, but an attempt to say, is there a smaller model? Um, so I'll say that, uh, like, ultimately the, the, the question that I have for all of these things kind of comes down to what you do with leftovers. Um, and I don't really like anybody's solutions in this space yet. Um, and so there's a tangent we can go off on about update monads, which I should probably do at some point here. I'm just catching the things to talk about. Um, update monads. What was the other one that we talked Like vector algorithms. Algorithms. Uh, I just want to backpack that. I'm just making a parking lot of stuff to consider in the future. Um, there we go. Uh, like this is this is this is my parking lot. This, this is more for me than anything. Um, so with with pipes versus conduit, if I remember right, the major distinction there is what you do with leftovers and how careful you are with resource management, like with resource cleanup. That uh, conduit cares very heavily about the resource cleanup, and um, that was the major distinction between the two things, which sometimes made things a little bit unnatural, and then. Pipes picks, both of them kind of pick up like 50 different type arguments for all of the different things about, well, what is the leftover stuff that you have when you're done with the stream? And uh, what is the type of the values you're giving? And if you're getting any messages back or something like that, because Pipes has the bidirectional version and all that kind of stuff. Um, so so Conduit, I think Conduit's biggest strength is that it has this, um, it has a very good resource management story. Um, pipes has the like the bi-directional pipe story which i think is interesting um, machines was an attempt to say can i get away with something less like it's not surprising to me that i can make a type with five type parameters fit almost any problem um it's um not necessarily the nicest design to make my users jump through the hoops of, work, of, of using them and so machines was me attempting to play around with that can i um capture some problems that, that, that are that exist with pipes which is that if you look at pipes if you mix um, bind based composition and the like categorical composition of pipes then you can get code that has like terrible asymptotics where your asymptotics are proportional to the amount of stuff you've consumed so far um, and so I wrote machines as a largely as a reaction to that um, because I wanted to make sure that I couldn't write the code that behaved badly. Do I have any favorite recommendations for learning category theory and its use in functional programming? Um, it's a good question. Um, there's a, I gave us Cora question, a Cora answer. on this topic, which goes in deeper than I can do right now. Best textbook for category theory. This I'll link into the chat. So that textbook, or the, like this is a series of answers based on like, well, where are you starting from? Um, and in terms of like how much review you're going to need. So I would go, I would go through this. So what what is left? What are leftovers? Um, so let's say that you want to read from a pipe, and you go like you're reading until I don't know um, until you stop seeing whole records or something like that, and then then you go oh actually I consume too much stuff, and you want to put it back. That's what the idea of leftovers is about. Um, and so the story there. For me, is I think that like talking about a leftover type in your stream is slightly flawed, and this like this has to do with where I was starting to talk about this notion of an update monad. 
So maybe what I should do is describe what an update monad is, and then we can sketch how streams would look like, or let's just do parsers or something, and then we can, then we can say that streams have an analogous problem. That should work. All right. So let's just take the idea of a, let me switch this over to the coding screen. Um, there's a notion of a list of successes parser. This is probably the easiest parser for me to do this to. So I'll start there. Um, a parser of A's is a parser from strings to lists of things and strings. This is uh, sort of the approach that Wadler took in his list of successes paper in like the late 80s sometime. Okay, this is a way to write monadic parsers. So you can view this as like state T of list. So far so good. Um, and yes, Bartosz's category theory for programmers is a great starting point uh, because he goes uh, on at length about all the things you, you kind of need to have some exposure to. Okay, so the problem here is like, what happens if I want to like start saying like parser from like list of characters or list of bytes or something like that? I want to be able to tokenize this up or something like that. Now, um, my input is both contravariant, because it's an input, but it's also an output here of the next piece of state. So how, how can we make a parser such that C is actually like properly contravariant? And so for this, the tool that I like to reach for is something called an update, the idea of an update monad. And I'm going to mangle Tarmos notion of an update monad in order to make it fit with like Haskell type classes and monads and stuff like that. This is not the most general form of this. Um, but the idea would be um, we need the first notion of a monoid, which I, I'm going to assume everyone in the audience or enough people in the audience are comfortable with the notion of a monoid. But then I want the notion of a monoid action. which is that my monoid turns into a function from S to S. It takes some state and turns it into a new state. So it takes, and what I want is that the action of mempty is the identity function and the act of M dot the act of N is the act of M appended with N. So there's this, this is a monoid homomorphism from M into endo S. And we're assuming that M is a monoid. Okay, and the idea here is that instead of working with like of, a, of an arbitrary state monad, and I'm going to give you back a new state. What I really want is I want an arbitrary state monad, and I have some monoid that I'm going to act on it with that will give that when I finishes acting will give me my new state. So instead of the list of successes parser, what I really want is what I want is something like this, where I'm going to choose to have int which I'm going to pretend is a monoid with addition, acts on list of A's, and I'm going to pretend that this is always non-negative by uh, via drop. So you can then work out that you know drop of four dot drop of three or drop is drop of you know four plus three. Drop of zero is the identity function. And so we can describe how this monoid acts on my state, and then we can turn around and build a monad for um, for how this works. But now the, the key thing is that this notion of a parser is contravariant in its input type. So one of the problems that I have with um, like streams that have leftover contents, if I can write, if I can say, no, 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 I didn't actually eat that, and I can shove things back into the pipe um, after I've pulled them out, then um, the variance of the inputs gets affected. 
And so, if I remember right, there's a story in Pipes that works for some of the time. As long as you haven't done anything for pushing back, then you can still map over the input type because they bolt in yet another type parameter. Um, on the other hand, if what instead you did was you said, well, I'm, I, I take my input and I've only consumed this much of it. Like, I, I give back kind of like a receipt that says, okay, I'm done with that now. You can now advance. Um, then I can actually have the variance properties that I want. So we can just, let's just do this with parser string. We'll do the boilerplate. Ignore the string. Give back an AM zero. And then we need to and then we need to do the bind. Give me a string, and then I will run M on my string. We're going to do this in the list monad. Just going to give me back an A and an M uh, monoid value. Um, what am I going to call the monoid things? Um, N. How many characters have I consumed? Drop N off of my string. And then I'll call F of A. And this thing is going to give me back a B and some um, call this thing parser P. There we go. And then I'll just return uh, B, but I'm gonna need I'm gonna need to mash these results together. There we go. So here we've got this notion of a parser, and this is a this is a case of an update monad, because we could define a more general pattern here, where we'd say like new type update s m a or something like that. This update uh, update t, I'll call it n the monoid. Get update. You give me a state and I'll give you an M full of A's and my monadic up my monoidal update to S. So this is a more general pattern. And then you can actually turn around and find out that monoid is the, actually the wrong abstraction to build your actions on if you really want to build the most powerful po version of an update monad. Um, and Tarmo Stello has a, like a short one page write up on the concept in a, in Agda or something. So the update is not quite reader plus writer plus state. It's um, it's a, I have a state, but instead of being able to like with a normal state monad, you can get and put, right. Um, there's a problem. Like, let's say that you had like um, a monad where what you were putting in your state were like the state of file handles or something like that. And then you were to get the current state, you would have access to all the, the file handles that you had. But then you did something that closed one of those. The fact that you could put and then get back access to the now dead file handle, even though the IO effect or something like that has already happened, is not a thing that you really want to have a thought you could think. So maybe what you want to have is a an update monad where you have a series of changes, a deltas that you're allowed to apply to your state. And then it's only the states that are reachable through the chains of deltas that you can actually wind up in. How does the monad, uh, in this case, I have this monad, monad action class. So you would have to instance monad m monoid action ms or ns monad update t s n m. Yeah. So that's the thing that you'd want. This is a fun little exercise. I mean, it's basically generalize this code.
But since this is already done in do, you've got the right idea. Instead of addition, this becomes mapend. Instead of drop, this becomes act. And then you can build parser by pretending that what we're going to do is we're going to build an instance. So the, the problem here is that this is a type class without a functional dependency between the two arguments. And so almost every use of this thing is going to wind up in the hell of overlap. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why I haven't bothered to package this thing up is because it, like the software engineering of it is terrible. Um, the notion of update that I've given here is um, not the most general notion of an update monad. So, like, the fact that we picked monoid was kind of the problem. Like, in theory, this thing could pick the unit based on S. And at that point in time, you can actually build a proper state monad out of an, as, an, as a special case of update. So... You don't really want the unit law of your monoid. You want a thing that says, given an S, I can give you a unit such that the action of um, that unit or pseudo unit on S is gives you S. So you want you you want a slightly weaker unit law, and that's that's one of the reasons why I haven't packaged this because I don't really want to use monoid actions. I can use the monoid actions for this cute little parser example. So anyways, um, so going back to the streaming question, uh, one idea is that you can use um, Uh, the, this notion of like an update mode, like what is the what is the change? Well, how much how much of the input stream have I consumed as a number rather than as I'm going to take my input state and give you a new input state? Because once once you once you can take a new input state and give it, get an output state that may not be related to the input state, you have trouble like tracking like your changes in position. You have all sorts of other things that you start having to be careful about. You have to worry about people putting back things that they didn't actually get out of the stream. Um, I don't think state is exactly first or last. It's a little bit different. I mean, you can get away with like a maybe update for it, which it's just a little bit too big. If you want it to be like right sized, you want the slightly smarter unit law. And um, yeah, that's that's the, that's the version that's just a little bit too big. Um, I wrote a little blog post that actually goes through this parser example that I sketched here in more detail. Um, as a bit of a pun on the Waddler write up, it's how to replace failure by a heap of successes. I'll dump the link in the chat. And uh, yeah, so this builds the notion of a right monoid action and then the notion of an update monad. And then Eventually, it notices that um, for parsers in particular, we can look at all parsers that, that consume something of a given length, and then the applicative can be more efficient. That was the, the purpose of this article, was showing that um, by having applicative as a superclass of monad and having access to the applicative combinators, we can actually make a parser that gets away with being slightly more clever for uh, consuming input. Um, and doing less um, combinatorial explosion when you had 
several applicative several things that were coming out of the applicative combinators that were taking initial parses of the same length. Anyways, um, but Tarmo had. This little, I think this is the like the one or two pager, on co-interpreting directed containers. Oh, this is the this is the longer, uh, more accessible article. This article by Tarmo is probably the most accessible introduction to the concept, and it more carefully introduces the unit law that I want. If I'm correct, it's been a while. Set in a monoid with a right monoid action in the set. So the, 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 they have this one, but he has another paper. But I'm not going to be able to find it now live on the stream. Anyways, those are, those are um, the thoughts that I have on streams, which is that we probably want some kind of, hey, I've consumed this rather than pushing back unread updates. Um, it, it's generally the way I think about parsers and streaming to me is sort of an online form of a parser. Um, I'm going to have to think about the, the co-update being like for a thing being slightly bigger than store or offline. I just, I can't turn those cycles. All right, we've been running for a couple hours here. I'm going to take a quick uh, bio break and then pick up in about five minutes. I'll be right back. And I'm muted. No, I'm not muted. And I'm back. 
why I needed Profunctor. I didn't need Profunctor. I wanted it to be contravariant in its first argument, which bothered me. And so Profunctor was just sort of capturing that fact. What are the space and time characteristics of applicative and alternative parsers? Um, the none of those things say much of anything about space and time. Uh, the uh, I like naively one would start to think like if you look at the types involved in monad and applicative, you start to think, oh, well, I can parse context-free things in applicative and context-sensitive things in monad. Um, unfortunately, that. Um, doesn't even hold because if you have a finite alphabet, you can use applicatives to parse context sensitive grammars because applicative tree, like the tree of applicative actions you do can be infinite. So you, ha you can have basically an infinite number of states. And so you can't even say like the class of language you can recognize with um, applicative is weaker than the class of languages you can recognize with monad. So you can do already do context sensitive things in like alternative Um, so keep that in mind. It's a the the rabbit hole goes pretty deep there. There's a uh, paper on I think Niels Anders Daniel, Niels Anders Danielson total parser combinators Agda yeah and so this paper goes into the fact that you can implement um, arbitrary context uh, sensitive grammars using just applicative. So um, now that said, there are th things that you can write that are like, um, if you can get away with expressing your problem as an applicative problem, like there is a class of parsers that uh, um, Swirstra and Dupontiel did which was actually a uh, large part of the original motivation behind arrows, which are better expressed as applicatives for recognizing LL1 grammars. And um, you would have to have something like, uh, can I give an example of uh, something that I can't parse with an applicative? You would have to have something like a function space or something like that rather than like characters or something like that as your input values. Just something that you artificially can't inspect. So each of the tokens would be a thing you can ask questions about, but they might not have a finite number of questions. Kofri of reader char list of A's. Um, is that a parser? Hold on. I have not, I've not experimented with that notion of a parser. What is that parser? So that's a, here's a list of A's and a function from a character to a list of A's and. So this is uh, much like uh, the melee or the more machine encoding, except for the fact that now you've got a, like, it's like a more T or something. So you're getting back like what I've recognized at each individual step. Oh, I'm sorry. And I screwed up my coding thing again. Uh, Edwin, the idea was if, if your um, symbols the like the individual characters or whatever that you're recognizing in your grammar come from a finite alphabet then um it turns out that you can recognize context sensitive grammars over that alphabet um if it comes from an infinite al alphabet then the monadic parser combinators are slightly more 
then building monadic parser combinators are ever so slightly more powerful and can handle those. Did I link the Danielson paper? Here, I did. Okay. Um, but Fishy, I, I don't actually have the... So anyways, the, the, the parser that you have there is it seems a lot like the um, notion of like using a more machine or something like that as a like a stream processing unit like data more a b is more here's a b and you give me an a i'll give you a more a b except now you're saying that i want to be able to do um lists of b's here so you're allowed to consume many many things and then do an update It's a narrow situation. I will say this. The working with the applicative is going to actually be a lot less convenient in a lot of ways than working with the monad. And the other thing is, is that in general, um, with the applicative combinators and whatnot, um, what I'll want to do is um, abuse observable sharing. I, I have some fancy parsers that I've played around with that use um, like the observable sharing stuff that Andy Gill wrote for Lava um, to figure out like the the grammar and then afterwards I can do bottom up parsing and stuff that way. Divisible superclass of decidable. Um, so it works out that um, because we're coming from Hask, uh, so we're working with Hask op, um, I want divisible as a superclass of decidable because I wind up with the, I want the distributive law to, to apply in some sort of meaningful capacity in the same way that one would ideally want a distributive law for how alternative and applicative interoperate. Unfortunately, because applicative and alternative have like three different potential alternative laws or distributive laws, um, things get muddled. So um, I, I wanted the sort of refinement of that. In some sense, you uh, it, it's like there is a notion of building like a class for like alt or something like that or for plus, for like functor plus that is independent of alternative that should exist as well. It's just not a thought we bothered to think. And so I wanted the ability to interact more cleanly with the classes we have then rather than with the idealized class hierarchy that I could build in my own little world off to the side. Uh, when I first did Comonad, I, I, bought, I put like semi-Comonad, I think I called it extend or something like that, in as a super class of Comonad. And it made things going in and out of Comonad and Monad like where you you'd go from one side to the other um, suck. So I just eventually stopped dealing with the more refined class hierarchies in my own world where they interoperate with the rest of the ecosystem. It's just Haskell is bad at picking the exact mathematical abstraction and kind of forces you to pick a few good ones. It's just you got to pick. Um, and that's the... If I had to pick the thing that I don't like about Haskell, it's that. Anyways, I understand the, the the more machine. So it's it's not a that's more like a like for like a stream parser for like recognizing packets or something. Um, and anyways, as for what I think about it, um, I do think that uh, Cofree here tends to wind up being the wrong tool um, because this machine is not the most efficient implementation of more. Um, like you generally want to do something like. Um, build, um, let's just look at the more machine rather than your slight refinement of it. So more AB is slightly better implemented as more takes, um, if you told me how to take some seed state you have and give me a B and you have a way to update your R and you have an R, I have a more AB. Like these two things are equivalent. You can actually view this as like hitting this thing with you need it just the right point. Um, but this version of it has a more efficient F map because the F map only touches the final result and it doesn't like get in the way of taking every of the, every step along the way. So like if I'm going to parse several things and then look at the final answer only, 
the F map for this more machine is less efficient than the F map for this more machine. Um, so that's my that, that's about the limit of my thoughts on parser A is co-free reader char A. Um, I also have a um, article on. Representable folds, I think. PNGs and more. Um, no, that's not it. Conquering folds, commit. Where the heck is it? Representable folds. More for less. There it is. I know I wrote an article on this topic. So I have one step further that I can take that notion of a more machine, which I'll just dump into the chat. So that, that replaces the um, function spaces from R here by saying, well, find me, uh, there exists a representable G such that I have g of b's and g uh, or a function from a to g of rep g and a rep g lying around so this is the version of it that i give there and then it turns out that because representable lets you do things like playing with like zipping up these spaces and stuff more efficiently um, then this can be a much more efficient, like self-tabulating more machine. Like, cause this G can act as sort of a memoizing container. What is representable? Um, or perhaps what is not representable in has. So a representable functor, I'll just write the definition of representable. as I give it. Um, I think this is a little bit off from the current definition that I have. I think I go through civ and stuff like that as a superclass, but whatever. The idea is fine. Um, there is a, a type I'll call the representation of a thing, and then I'll give a couple of operations. I'm going to call them tabulate and index here because that's what I used first. I think I've changed the names. Rep f arrow a and index. So what is this? I want these two functions to be inverses. If you can um, give me a function from whatever the representation of f is to a, I can give you an f of a. And if you can give me an f of a, I can give you a function from representation of f to a, such that tabulate.index equals id and index.tabulate is it. So let's build our first trivial example. Instance of representable for a function space from e. Well, type rep of function space from E is E. Tabulate is id. Index is id. Yes, this is isomorphic. I want, I want the function space from the representation of F to A to be isomorphic to um, F of A. Now, when a category theorist talks about representable functors, they're almost always talking about the um, contravariant case and Haskell Functor is, is the thing that we kind of, like covariant functors are the thing that we go to. So um, there's, I'm more careful to talk about representability versus co-representability and stuff like that in the, um, uh, in the documentation for adjunctions. So if you, if you start seeing what I'm talking about, if you start seeing co-representable flowing, flowing around here, it's more about whether or not we've got functions from a representation or functions to a representation. So I want these two th these two halves to be isomorphic. So like, what's another example? Um, we did a earlier data type. We did like bin A is bin AA. And I could say that this is representable. And it's represented by bool. And it's tabulate. You give me a function 
and I will give you f of false and f of true and index into my bin of a and b with false is going to give me the a and index into my bin a b with true is going to give me the b. I, I, uh, representable is saying that a it is isomorphic to a HOM set from the representation to the, a thing. This is a HOM set. Because you 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 want you want like uh, uh, this this should be like there exists some x which I'm going to call rep f that is like such that this is isomorphic to my f and in hom for hask this is just function arrow. And then we'll expand that. So there's a natural isomorphism between F and like the HOM sets from some type that I'm going to call a representation. Now, usually in category theory, when they talk about representability, they're going to be talking about representability of a contravariant function, a contravariant functor, because they care about this stuff in topology and places where they're dealing with pre sheaves and the like. And so those things are going to be, um, we're going to wind up with the arrows going the other way. But here we're talking about functors, so it goes this way. So this is representability. Um, so what is not representable? Um, either is not representable. Um, I would need to figure out a way to make an either A be isomorphic to a function from something that like doesn't know the A. Early papers on GDTs implemented isomorphism witnesses. Um, eh, interesting. Um, well, GDTs don't actually give you a way to talk about isomorphism in Haskell. Like, we don't have the ability to talk about. Here's a proof that like f dot g equals id and g, you know g dot f equals id. We just we're missing the vocabulary to talk about value level equality at, like as a, as a type level thing. Another place where um, representability breaks down is going to be something like pair with E is going to also fail. In general, what's going to happen is all of your representable things are going to be isomorphic to a function because that's what they are. And if your thing isn't re isomorphic to a function from something that we can call the representation, then it won't be representable. Anyway, so representable functors should be distributive, which distributive is just that um, you can pull it out of any function space. So that's that's what I've got um, as the represent representable class in um, the junctions package. And if you, you can then see that, because I could always pick this to be a function from R, I haven't lost any representability by going from this form to this one. Um, but what I've gained is that I can play games with tabulate and index. And this G acts as sort of like an auto memoized, uh, memoized version of this function in some cases. So I gain the ability to build more efficient state machines, even if I don't have to take advantage of it. So that's the end of my... Um, I think that's that is literally everything I have to say about that uh, particular co-free reader thing. Interestingly, that that co-free reader thing is very close to um, how we first derived the the like the idea of like bidirectional pipes was like like trying to figure out like from a standpoint of something like a singularity style actor like the, the Microsoft Singularity project was a little. Um, 
a thing where they had like Sing Sharp was a project for specifying like the contracts on channels and stuff like that and reasoning about uh, the behavior of these little programs that were written in C Sharp. And um, they had these these funny little channels which had two endpoints and like an internal state machine. And so I, I played around with like when I first started at uh, S and P, um, I played around with just ripping open one of those state machines and saying, well, what is it, what would this look like as a functor to do, kind of do the free set of actions that I can take on my channels? And then um, I pinged uh, Gabriel Gonzalez about that, and um, about a week or two later, I think he shipped a new version of Pipes with all the bidirectional Pipes machinery based on that idea. So if you're wondering where all the bidirectional pipe stuff in pipes came from, it came from a previous exploration of, well, what have we been talking about today? Like building a implementation of something as a free monad and then figuring out how to interpret it later. Um, and then playing around with this notion of uh, like this more machine and looking at its internal state. Ultimately, we just kind of discarded the state machine thing, or I discarded the state machine thing, and it was just left with this, like, basic, hey, look, I, I can give you a message, you give me a message, and I might consume multiples or um, give back multiples at a time, which is basically what this, um, or what the flavor of, like, more like machine that you mentioned is. Where are bidirectional channels useful? Um, I think... Uh, If you need to be able to communicate back upstream, then having some notion of bidirectional communication is better, is, is useful. Um, if uh, the problem with it is that it kind of mucks with your ability to express like, I don't know, here's an applicative that's going to consume two, like I'm going to, I have two things that both want to consume the same input. They both, both might want to give different feedback upstream. And so um, bidirectional stuff isn't free. It, 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 like it comes at an actual cost. So I, I can definitely see why people would have success moving away from like, like the bidirectional messaging. Um, but like if you want to do flow control or if you want to control what you're being fed without having to use some extra kind of side channel to get the information back, it can give you like... Um, back pressure and all these other things that people like to talk about in these uh, streaming channel kind of th systems. Including state clean. I don't quite follow that. Mm. Yes, it's definitely a way to keep things organized. If hot's aim is to abstract all mathematics, do I think it makes sense to program in hot abstractions instead of category theory abstractions? Um, how to put this? Um, I find um, I find hot really interesting. I find the math of it wonderful. Um, I find there's lots of things that I want to think in hot. I really like the fact that it gives me a type theory where I can punt almost all of the concerns about equality up to the meta theory, and I don't have to play with setoids and all the awful things that make um, like doing more advanced category theory stuff in cock awful. Um, like I'm interested in using hot as a, like more of a code organizational tool than almost anything. Like as a, as a way to say, um, here's a way to reason about lots of proof terms where if I were to try and write them directly, if I, if I go to work with like monoidal categories or something, even like monoidal categories are about where category theory, I think starts. And it's about the peak of what you can start really talking about in something like Cock or Agda today. Um, and it's largely because all of the administrative plumbing of all the setoid crap makes it so that um, performance grinds to a halt. Like um, I was working with Dan Peebles at the time when he started a little categories library in Agda. And it, it would take like 15 minutes to compile if you loaded the files in the right order to make small changes. Um, the idea of a setoid is to say, here is the notion of a set, and here's the notion of a quality that I want to work with. And if I give you a function, I should give you a function from setoid to setoid and a proof that this function respects the setoid. That, like if, if A equals B over here, then F of A equals F of B over there. Um, and so once you have to put, like carefully manipulate all these value level equalities inside of your programming language, 
um, in your little dependent type theory, then your dependent type proofs get really, really big. And so um, there's been a lot of work on, like, um, I think Jason Gross has a little library in Cock for doing category theory um, that, that very carefully um, focuses on minimizing the size of the Galena proof terms. And that, that path is sort of the path that I've seen that gets the farthest category theory-wise. So why am I rambling on about category theory-wise when you asked about um, hot? So I really like hot. I do think that the, um, the math there is great. I think the software engineering of a lot of the solutions that I've seen in the hot space is garbage. Which is, what I mean by that is that if you look at, um, uh, how to describe this? Uh, like, if you look at, like, the stuff that Vavadsky built up for, for doing hot as, like, as, like, as a library, it's, here's a pile of proofs of everything that we can talk about in, about the, um, uh, how to put this? Here, here's a pile of proofs. Here's everything that I know how to prove about paths, and here is this random, almost um, Hungarian notation style, like Samanyi style inspired, like mangling of the name of the proof for doing a given thing. Like the like stuff just gets kind of like spewed in at the top level, and not really um, isn't isn't organized in any sort of like reusable fashion. Now the idea is that. You build the paths, and then you build up all the category theory stuff up as so like truncations, like H sets, on top of this path vocabulary. Um, what I actually found fairly interesting was like doing a little experiment. This was a few years ago. Um, out of this, John Wigley started up a um, a library for doing categories in Cock. But uh, like on GitHub, Ecomet, there's this little homotopy package that I started. I just thought this was a fun little exercise of using cock to write most of my hot code for me by saying, like, all I was doing, like, I'm, I'm this is not going to be a terribly um, insightful walk through this code, but it's, let's build up the notion of paths and base paths, build up the notion of, like, what a category is, naively. And then... Um, build up a very simple tactic that just goes through my environment and destroys paths and then tell, then use that as my way of handling obligations. And um, when I'm done, this is how I give the category of types. I just say here, it's a category and its home sets look like this. And that stupid nine line tactic above is sufficient to figure out how to fill in what the notion of objects are, what the identities are, what the uh, composition looks like the proof of the associativity of composition, all that kind of stuff followed from these things. So I just gave this much information and nine lines worth of tactic code wrote my whole category for me. Um, which I find really exciting. Like this was a really, this was really nice for me. Um, and then I built up a bunch of other stuff for dealing with the action on paths and it's automatically building the functor and all the proofs and all the laws. All these little holes are being filled in by those obligation tactics. So this much of it, I was really happy with. And the idea here was to try and like take hot and tackle the software engineering problem by using category theory as a vocabulary for how to package up the stuff that we're dealing with on paths. So just kind of giving it a, like, giving like the naive definition of a category as a, like basically like a type class, and then like showing that paths and base paths fill in that role means that the software engineering of hot can benefit because I'm not um, just spewing things into a, into a global namespace with a pile of conventions. Um, so so this that should let me get back to your um, your question. Do I think I want to do everything in hot rather than category theory vocabulary? No, I want to use the category theory vocabulary to make my hot vocabulary better. And then I want to use the hot vocabulary in order to make my category theory implementable. Because it's still useful to me to turn around and have all this. Um, once I have all this stuff in hot, I can then do all my work on monoidal categories and stuff like that. And things compile instantly um, rather than taking forever. Uh, the, the downside of all of this is that um, all the like a significant portion of the tricks that we have that make cock efficient don't work once you have hot like um, 
like uh, Adam Chapala has a bunch of stuff in his books about how to like build a domain specific solver or something like that for your thing, then prove that you can erase it out into prop, and then do your work in that so that the resulting proof term has the like this big boilerplate proof about some some hairy domain completely erased. And that's not admissible in in hot because you can't have an erasable prop. So there's tension between the techniques that we have that, for how to make the horrible things go fast and the things that hot can make fast by just simply punting all of those concerns out into the meta theory and saying, well, higher inductive types could exist. And so they're admissible here. We don't necessarily know if you have hot, um, and, uh, trying to work from that, but if, if that's at all informative. Um, any good reference on hot? Yeah, the hot the, the hot book is probably the best starting point. It's really the only starting point. There's a few blog posts and talks that people have given, but that's about it. Um, so this is implemented in um, the... This was at the time it required a version of Cockhead from whenever this was in 2014. I'm pretty sure Universe Polymorphism has probably been added in the main line and stuff like that. I know I've, I've, I've completely checked out a cock in the last three years. Um, so this was this did not use like the like the hot cock or cock hot or whatever it is um, branch of cock. So um, I just didn't use prop. I defined my own equality that lived in type and then um, worked with things that didn't need K. So I was using this as sort of a, a way to get my feet wet on, on hot. Yes, hot cock. We can ramble on about that for. That's probably going to get me banned from Twitch or something. Did I use the predicative? Um, I didn't use. Um, the impredicative bits of, of prop, so I believe so. I just uh, I didn't no, I didn't need it. I didn't need co-induction here uh, because I wasn't uh, like trying to build all of the crazy things. <laughs> uh, basically, what I was writing was here's a bunch of things that are true in Martin Lift type theory, written using a vocabulary of the action of paths. Um, nothing that I wrote in that module I believe actually needed univalence. I just used the vocabulary of the action of paths as a way to um, talk about rewriting terms. And so it's, it's things that are true if you have hot and if you don't. And then the idea was that I would build up as much of that stuff as I could possibly do without assuming anything. Um, and then come back through and, and add all the stuff that needed univalence. Anyway, so this little project eventually, I think I ran into some things where my approach started to to fall apart and that's when uh, because I was like this was uh, John Wegley was trying to get me to write write, write cock with him and uh, it uh, we, we started doing it with the setoid stuff it started being slow like it always is and I wrote this as a little side project yeah it's a stripped down version of um, of hot just just with a focus of um on uh, like the software engineering, like the organization of it, it, it was just it was just like a like a spike solution. I wrote it for like two days. Any pet peeves and things to consider when building a library? Um, probably my biggest pet peeve when building a library is the number of complaints I'm going to get from people who have contradictory uh, requests about me incurring or not incurring dependencies on third party libraries. 
It's one of the like that's like my in many ways it's a pet peeve with the way package management works in Haskell. There was also the thing with all the data constructors being private, so you can't add the instances you need. Oh yes, when, when, I, have, I have a great deal, of, a number of pet peeves around other people using other people's libraries when they don't expose enough of the internals for me to get by. Um, which is one of the reasons why so much of the ecosystem of code that I write is closed, uh, in the sense that I tend to build on my own packages rather than others so much, unless it's something like text or containers or something. Do you export all of your data constructors, Ed? Almost all of them. I do have a few things that I actually have got private, and it's mostly because of um, either an accident in the sense that it was just like, it was going to be too awkward to make an extra internal module, and I haven't needed it yet. And so when somebody asks, it will become public immediately. Um, but for the most part, yes. Hmm, I think there's kind of a related issue. So some some uh, packages um, like free monad implementations do things like um, say, well, this this meets the functor identity law, except if you can look at the data constructors. Mm -hmm. For example, fmap might add another wrapper layer, and technically that's observable if you can see all the data constructors. It's not observable if you can't. Mm -hmm. If you can look, at, if you can observe the difference by looking at data constructors export through an internal package, would you still say that that uh, follows the functor laws? I would say so because, I, like, when I say I have an internal module, I'm saying all laws are gone, all every like anything you want to do in here, you, you like you've loaded the gun, you've pointed it at your foot, you can pull the trigger if you really want to go for it. Um, so I, I don't like I don't even make my internal I don't consider my internal modules. When I say, you know, foo dot internal, whatever, uh, I don't even consider those to pass the PVP. Like, I will break their implementation on a minor version. And if you depend on my internals, you logically need to actually depend on the minor version. Um, it's just... They're super All brittle. Right. I'm definitely going to link to this, this discussion the next time this comes up and people want to fight about it. Yeah, go for it. I'll, I'll put up my dukes and, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm just path induction and all the magic is just figuring out the right type. Smash product, that guy. I'm going to hide my horrible uh, effort at... This was literally my first effort in writing cock code in like four years of that time. I'd taken a pretty long hiatus before that. All right, other questions? We seem to have cleared the table. We are. We cleared the chat room clear as well, obviously. Using topology abstractions to model code instead of category theory. Um, it's interesting. It's largely, I think, the, the difference is more that um, it's very difficult to get um, things that you can talk about in topo like with like in, in heavily topology inspired code that don't need lots of ability to talk about functional extensionality of functions and like talking about value equality. Um, you can probably get more use out of it in a dependent type setting than you can in Haskell or something. Um, I do use. Um, pre-sheaves and co-pre-sheaves and whatnot a, a fair bit in my thinking, um, which kind of come out of a, like the, like the, the, the growth and deke style of uh, ed, end of category theory and the topology bits. Um, Topoi are like fit into that same kind of uh, framework. Like you, 
Like, even if you just start like talking about like I need a sub object classifier and stuff like that, you start getting into this messy domain of um, like having to replace all this stuff that we have that uses parametricity and all this stuff with with real category theory, and it just becomes kind of awkward. To, it's just awkward to encode. In code, um, like I, I think there's like the notion that um, you know category theory gives you a bunch of good questions to ask, and, the, and that uh, Topoi give you a way to bridge results from one mathematical domain to another. I think that's interesting, and I think there's a lot to be done there. Um, I just don't think that it's um, being leveraged effectively now. Does it have a future? I think so. Um, Yeah. Um, I, I think a lot of it is that um, how to put it. The you know the elementary theory of the category of sets and stuff like that to, like shows us that you can express all this like set theory and stuff through like the language of category theory, right? Um, I can switch back over to the view of messages here. Um, but the working with functors from and to um, like the one object or zero object, you know, like category and stuff like that are um, out of, are really clunky tools. Can I um, SPMD on SIMD work on since RTS? Um, okay, so what happened there was I started running into a pile of problems with the compiler, um, which is that it really isn't easy to do. Um, so what I was, so let me let me give some context to folks who weren't paying attention to all that stuff when I was doing it. Um, so I wrote a little. Let's see if it's on this machine. I don't know. There we go. Get the right machine. Um, get uh, get clone. Get at github.com. Oh, I need to commit. Uh, RTS. Get. And, um,. Jeff Shake, there's there's no problem with being off topic. This whole session is, hey, ask me all of the off topic questions you could possibly imagine because this way I can get a lot of this stuff out of the way and maybe we can figure out a like a a stream that actually codes something. Um, I anticipate doing more of these Q and A things uh, going forward, so they're going to be a fairly regular component. So in the um, RTS code, I wrote this fairly horrible pile of C++ for expressing a pattern that uh, Matt Farr talks about as SPMD on SIMD. He took the name from somebody he worked with. And it's, um, the idea is to write code more like people write shaders, where you have um, several um several arguments to a function being computed at the same time. So like, say you want to do an addition, you're going to take a, like a vector, a varying int, and you're going to add it to another varying int, which is going to be actually a SIMD register full of ints. You'll add them directly. And so what you do is you, when you do like an if or something like that, what you're actually doing is you're computing a mask, which will then be applied to all of the writes within out of that mask, with, with inside of that uh, branch. So you'll take the true branch if any one of these several inputs takes true. And the idea is that you pick several not to be like this big vectorized thing like data parallel Haskell, but exactly equal to whatever the optimal SIMD width unit is on your machine. So like eight wide or something like that. You do eight things at a time in these kind of things that act like warps or something on the GPU. Um, and this, was the, this was the idea of the SPMD on SIMD stuff. So um, what happened was the you really want to be able to start saying, well, in this function, you're allowed to use these SIMD instructions. And there's tricks that I can use to get Clang and GCC individually to do this, but I can't trick ICC into doing it correctly, and I can't trick Microsoft into doing it correctly. So 
I think I pretty much have to go off and do what ISPC does, which is go through LLVM and then hook, then annotate the functions individually to say what the optimizations are allowed or what um, compiler targets are allowed function by function um, when I go to compile things. So the last thought that I had on this was that in theory, GHC gives me, I started trying to do this, like it's the same kind of thing in GHC where I started trying to express, can I build like a, um, a module signature for uh, like a particular SIMD architecture, like where here's what my mask types look like. Here's what a vector of int for whatever width I want is. And I'm totally not showing my screen. Uh, there we go, code. Um, so here is like what a map, like a mask is um, this underlying GHC like prim type. And here, like this might be int 32 times eight and int 64 times, well, four paired with int 64 times four or something like that. Um, and each one of these things lives in kind hash. And here's how to make a vector of them. And then here's how we do broadcasting and packing and unpacking and like trying to package up all the things that GHC offers. But this thing ran into the same kind of packaging problem as um, as the C++ code, which is that I can't tell GHC when you link against this backpack module, you should use these compiler options. And so um, my current thinking is to use the LLVM backend to spit out I don't know. Um, Cabal new build. LLVM test. I just want to build this LLVM test thing just so I can spew some LLVM to the output. Yeah, I want to be able to use different SIMD widths in different parts of my project. So the idea is that you would compile the code um, once per SIMD width. And then you'd have one top level function that dispatches to whichever one is the right one for your architecture. Um, and the idea with the backpack module solution was to say that what you'll do is you'll, you'll write your code as a backpack module itself parameterized over the SIMD backend. And then you can write a top level, um, uh, you can instantiate your backpack module several times with the different SIMD width units that we have and then write one top-level dispatch loop that picks the right one and then runs your whole program um, after basically specializing off the CPU. But then I can't keep GHC from turning around and trying to use instructions and stuff that aren't available on your CPU. So this, is the, like, this has been my major pain point. So that's been a pain point. The other one is that I basically have to basically have to reinvent the entire Intel SVML library, which is the short vector math library. Um, so the work that we did on the SPMD package, I built like sine and cosine, which are based on, I think, AVX math fun. I reported them, I ported them down to a more general type and we, we got sine and cosine log. Um, I started doing ATAM two and a couple of other things, but I basically need to build the entire like gallery of mathematical functions, duplicating the work of a whole pile of people at Intel where the, you know, they have a bunch of mathematicians who, who can do this stuff and who it's where it's their job. Um, and that was where I kind of ran out of steam on the, the, the C++ project was. I was doing that, and then I ran into the foundational issue that um, I couldn't prevent the compiler from doing optimizations and using instructions in local functions that it shouldn't be able to use. And so the current goal is to go through and do something kind of like the LLVM um, backend that's used by ISPC and, and do that, and then see if maybe I can do all of my um, standard library for mathematical functions to avoid a dependency on the Intel C compiler in order to have any speed. Wow, this thing is taking forever. Man, whoever this lens guy is really needs to break up his code.
Did that answer your question on the SVMD on SIMD stuff? Do you have to start your own server on Discord to get voice to work? Are you not able to talk on Discord? You have to click on the general voice channel. I, I really like the idea of the, RS, of the RTS approach. I just don't know how to do it. Um, not with the languages we have. Um, one of the things I keep wanting to do is to like turn around and build my little next toy compiler or something like that to just emit code in that fashion. Um, and I've been kind of torturing myself trying to figure out ways that I can write like GHC style code in that manner. Oh, so, so the problem is, is that the, um, I want to be able to say for this particular function, that you're allowed to use AVX2 instructions. And then for this particular instruction, you're allowed to use whatever. Um, and those things are going to wind up becoming like inherited traits of the downstream code based on what they force in line. And so if you look at the code for Intel's ray tracer, Embry, uh, they have a bunch of things where they just magically assume that the compiler won't do any damage. And um, if they write the compiler, I guess they can trust that. But uh, I don't write their compiler, so I can't trust it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so both Clang and GCC give me different mechanisms for turning on or off individual compiler flags for different parts of a C file. Um, but then when I start doing C++ stuff, what I really need is that for this template, then these flags are instantiated. But they should also be instantiated for the people who are calling this template. And that's the sort of thing that I can't really talk about. Um, and I can't do it in, in GCC either, or GHC either. So with LLVM, I can do that on a... I can um, mix and match architectures and stuff like that in the entire in the binary. and have complete control over it. Oh, it's uh do, 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 do. No. Man. Yeah, I can pretty print uh Hell of yeah. Yeah, so the idea was um, using C processing macros to do it. Uh, that is one path to do it. Like that is like the, the sort of ghetto solution, which is to instead of doing all the template metaprogramming, you just CPP your way to glory. Um I personally don't really want to live in that world. Uh, my original goal with writing the stuff in C++ was that um, I had all this code for playing around with VR and whatever. And um, I had a bunch of things I just wanted to do that needed a little bit of ISPC. I don't know. Um, GitHub Ecommit VR. Um, and in there we had... I don't know, um, like a bunch of stuff for dealing with like spherical harmonics and for dealing with like um, different encodings of like a spectrum or something like that. And all this stuff like is perfectly trivial to do via SIMD. I would like to just be able to call Pragma on PHSIMD and have it do the right thing. The other alternative is that I could store everything ALS or SOA. Um, yeah. Um, 
and then get um, something like uh, ISPC to do the work. But then the moment this thing becomes generic in the type that it's carrying around, this wasn't, uh, you know, if N is a, is a concrete thing, then the ISPC thing always pays a tax. I, I'd have to instantiate it um, directly for each one of the individual points, and then I'm working point-wise on a thing that's otherwise abstract. It just felt like the, the interop was ugly enough that, of course, I'm willing to spend the entire summer writing a compiler. I don't know. Um, anyway, it was, it, was, it was enough to drive me to trying to write the whole thing as a library. Um, I was rather saddened when my efforts to try and shove the mask in a like you can't do you can't shove the mask in a register. Ideally, if uh, GCC was still king of the hill, you could just um, say, "Hey, here's a top level register annotation that says um, get steal one of the XMM registers for the entire application, and it's mine, and I'm going to use it as a mask." And um, Clang has no such functionality. Um, in theory, you could add a calling convention, but you'd have to build your own architecture and stuff, and you'd have to build your own custom fork of Clang. Lazy expression templates and say what SIMD what you want in instantiation time. Well, that was the idea. Is, um, if you look at the... Um, where's the harness? I don't remember. There's a, there's a harness here that drives this whole thing. That uh, oh, I'm in the VR project. I'm not in the SIMD project. There's a there's a project in the RTS project that or there's a file in the RTS project that has the top level dispatch that goes through the set of instructions and architectures you've enumerated as part of the template parameters. Um, but again, that whole approach, I'm I think it could work well enough that no one would notice. But if, if compilers ever got sufficiently better at noticing that you're doing 228-bit ops and that it should be able to glue them together into 256-bit op using, like, super word-level parallelism tricks to mash things together, then all of a sudden um, you would start failing in older architectures. So I was really kind of bummed by the SPMD thing because I was really hoping to be able to do it directly as an EDSL in Haskell um, where the EDSL was going to be you write your code directly in Haskell and we use Haskell's support for passing SIMD registers and then I would have to get some things fixed like um, like foreign import prims for C minus minus I don't think currently can pass SIMD registers in a register and there's a few there's a few weird quirky things like, there's just missing types in some of the cases for foreign import prims. Um, but I was hoping that what I could do is write that, get this thing to spit out LLVM, then the LLVM optimizer can go through and do the inlining on those individual function definitions if I have to write something in LLVM myself to do individual things. Um, so that was my most recent stab at this. It would have, it would have made it thinkable directly in Haskell. By using Backpack to compile away all the things separately, um, and I might still go that direction. The other direction is to just turn around and build an EDSL for describing these pro programs, and um, then write a little compiler that just spews out all of them, and then links this stuff in process and does the work. But then I'm pushing to runtime stuff that should be done at compile time. The SIMD optimization in Haskell is like C++, H, H, everything is inlined. Uh, you don't have any compiled library in Haskell. So the idea is to use Backpack to, to make this thing go. So you'd, you would write the entire, your entire package would be written as a Backpack module that has parameter, which is the signature of what SIMD backend you're running on. And then you would instantiate it several times. And when you instantiate a Backpack module, it gets completely compiled separately like C++ template instantiation. Um, so, um, let me watch this. The idea here is this stream we set aside as basically just a, com a complete, like, throw open the doors Q&A session. So we haven't actually, um, really written any code this entire time. 
Um, we've just been doing Q&A stuff since noon. Um, if things do turn into a lull before 4, then I might get back into coding, but I'm anticipating that we'll probably just keep talking until 4, and then at that point, I think Puff and Fresh is going to turn on. Do I plan to do something with the Vulcan bindings for, um, for Haskell? So I started looking at it. Um, I think the... I think I need really, really modern Vulcan bindings, so I might have to. Um, what do I plan to live code? Um, well, if uh, I have a few things that I want to do, one, uh, one of them is really kind of like bugging me is this need for, um, I want to go through and spend some time on vector algorithms and see if we can backpack that. Because it's, it's the... Thing that's made me most sad about progress in our compiler performance is the degradation of performance of vector algorithms, and vector algorithms is sort of the, the flagship for the things that could benefit from knowing the instances involved. And it looks like Puffin Fresh is awake. So, um, are you going to start up at uh, about what is it, forty minutes? I want to circle back to the point that Riley Ralu had about C++, which is that um, you are actually programming in a, against a signature with backpack. That is, your code is checked against a signature, whereas mm -hmm. with your C++ approach, you're not actually type checking or doing any kind of checking until you've done the inlining. So you can write code, and it works against one particular uh, instantiation in C++, but you have no idea if it will work on a slightly different platform. Yeah, the, This is not true at all with the backpack approach. There's a lot of uh, connection between like the backpack approach and like C++ template metaprogramming with um, if we had concepts baked in, right? If C++ concepts we've gone through, then like it would be very similar to the backpack style. Um, in some ways, like the backpack style is still weaker than the C++ metaprogramming style in that... Um, there are, there's no way to write defaults. There's no way to do a lot of things that you can express in the C++ style. Um, the C++ style lets you do things like partial template specialization, which is not a thought you can think in the backpack style. Uh, C++ gives you substitution failure is not an error, which is not a thought you can think in the backpack style, which is good and bad. Um, it means the C++ is a I'm nightmare to test. It's, it's, it's bad, um, but it's also, like, if you actually try to... Um, like I was playing around with just trying to express like an MTL as a pile of backpack modules, which is a thing that I would like to be able to say. I would like to have a little library that is, it's not going to be a little library, an enormous library that is all of the modules and signatures you would need in order to be able to express the entire MTL. So you can say, I'm writing my code against this concrete monad and it is this module with its state pulled from this signature with its reader pulled from this and it's it's a chain of backpack signatures, right? It's a it's a it's a, actually quite a drastic thing to try and write a um, a monad transformer stack that way. But the thing is, is then all of the code is completely monomorphic in what monad it's running over, um, and it's really painful. Uh, I have not been able to really get to anything that I would want to wish on a third party yet. Do I any, ever write any code in a non-functional language? Um, if I, the examples that I was pulling up earlier here was this uh, VR project. And this thing is all C++. Well, aside from clicking on a lookup table. Um, all imperative-ish C++. Uh, C++ has functional elements. Um, and yes, hot end. And Backpack is um, C++ trying to, or Haskell trying to get um, sort of ML-like functors. Do I still think in CT when I'm working in those languages? I do, as much as I can. Um, a lot of my mental baggage is category theory inclined. 
I, I use category theory to think about how to put it. When a category theorist talks about like the unit dilemma or something like that, like they just think this is equal to that. When I, when I, when I, as a computer scientist, I care more about these operational concerns. And so I tend to think about category theory with this extra bit of, well, how does this operationally change the performance of my code? Um, and like that idea of, well, this saves me a walk here versus that, that kind of category theory thinking I use a lot in every language I work in. And uh, thank you, Ghost Hardware. It's, it's, uh, it's great to be streaming. This is working out really well. I'm really happy with it. Did I consider Rust for all the SIMD stuff? Um, how to put this? So the, the bits of C++ template metaprogramming that are possible under the, like the, the, the bleeding edge of modern C++, I use more than I suffer from the kinds of memory failure things that Rust is really good at protecting you from. So Rust is far enough behind like modern style C++ in terms of like what I can do with variadic templates and all the other crazy things that um, I find that I would be paying a lot more to get less than I would get like be giving up. The Curry Howard isomorphism. Um, the Curry Howard correspondence. Curry Howard Lambic the Brown. Whoever the hell else you're gonna throw in the mix. Um, is, how to put it, um, I think uh, Bob Harper uh, is one who, who's talked about this a few times, which is like, if you find something in just category theory or just logic or just programming, um, and you find it in one of those things, there's a good chance you might have just found something that's quirky to your particular environment. But like when you can when you can start seeing it through each one of those lenses, each one of them is like you know a blind man groping a different part of the elephant. Um, like you know when I look at things through category theory, I'm talking about the morphisms between them, the, like the ways things transform into one. What I can observe about a thing, like it's 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 all about like what I can see about a thing. When I'm looking at things from a um, logic perspective, I'm really more or less limited to caring about whether or not any program exists that has a given type. It's like if I like if I'm working with uh, things as a programmer, I often care about the asymptotic performance of the individual piece of code here, and so each one of those things is a different perspective on the same problem. Um, and so for me, the like having access to the Curry Howard correspondence is is a big deal in the sense that it gives me like three different like focal lengths so that I can look at my my code and my thoughts through. Um, do I do I see application of affine types, relevant types, and order types? Um, yes. So this was actually a thing that I obsessed about um, excessively in like two thousand six, two thousand seven, um, and I eventually got better and converged on like working with code that I can actually get. Um, stuff done in <laughs> um what i what i find is like i want a language that has sort of a lattice of modalities like uh let's see if i can do this as a sketch like instead of saying that we have um linear types and uniqueness types or linear types and um under like um unrestricted types or whatever like the normal types I want my affine and my relevant types. Like this stuff is really nice. The like this gives you a little like lattice of modalities. The problem is that relevant is almost always the wrong thing. Um, like the notion of strictness is like a better notion of relevance. Um, if I if I I can say that I'm strict in an argument if um, like relevance says that I can contract but I can never weaken. Affine says I can weaken, but I can never contract. Unrestricted says I can contract and weaken. Linear says I, I will um, never contract or weaken again. Um, so if we just use those terms, can I, can I am I in frame now? Um, if I just use those terms, I have a problem, which is that strictness in like, like the, the notion of like demand analysis is more that you can contract as long as at least one of the times you contracted, you don't weaken it. Um, and so I'm really interested in strictness is better than relevance. Like relevance logic was like coined by Newell Belknap in the 70s to try and like capture the notion that you don't want to be able to talk about something like 
you know, um, if, you know, the pub shits in the woods and the sky is purple, like, like one doesn't have any bearing on the other. Um, you wanted to have the, the things that you ask about to be relevant to the conclusions. Like, that was the ideas that it was trying to express. And it, um, I think relevance logic is sort of a dead end in, in terms of, like, computer science, because it's not a thing we're really interested in for the most part. Strictness, on the other hand, we're really interested in. Um, so I, there's this sort of middle ground where I'm interested in um, strictness being a slightly weaker guarantee than relevance. Although that's not really the thing that people usually talk about. And then the other thing is, is the other extent, the other extreme is like you have like down here, you have like uniqueness. And this is leaving off ordered constraints and all this other stuff, which, is, which live somewhere else in this lattice. Uh, where uniqueness is saying something about like how I haven't contracted or weakened this, well, trivially, I haven't weakened it, it's still around if I haven't contracted it. Um, I, haven't, I haven't shared this value with anybody, and so it's free for me to mutate it. So relevance is saying that um, I can copy this, I, I, I can give, I can use this fact multiple times, but if I give, if I split it, like if I, if I turn it A into A and A, then I have to consume both copies. Strictness is really saying something like, I can split this thing as many times as I want, but at least one of those copies of the A that I built has to be used. Um, that's the way I kind of think about strictness versus relevance. And strictness is a slightly more permissive notion of like relevance alike idea. Um, so the idea with uniqueness is more about I haven't like contracted or weakened the, I haven't contracted this thing yet, so I still hold the only reference to it, and so I could mutate it in place. But I don't know necessarily that it's sound for me to do that mutation if it's work safe. Like if it, like if, if we're and this is I'm 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 really I'm gonna piss off every logician who's listening to this thing because I'm talking about this in like these horrible like you know this is a resource and I'm mutating it like it's the wrong vocabulary I totally admit that I'm just trying to give some intuition. Um, the idea with uniqueness is really that you haven't changed the thing yet so it's possible for you to mutate it in place. Um, and then like uniqueness and linearity solve many of the same conditions. Linear is a future, it's like a promise of what you will do. Like, you won't contract or weaken this thing. Um, and therefore, you must consume it. Uniqueness is a promise that says you haven't contracted or weakened it, so it's possible for you to mutate it. But you could forget it. Uniqueness is still below affine. I can convert a uniqueness type into an affine type just by forgetting the fact that it was unique and then saying, well, I could still forget it. So this is down here. So there's this lattice with uniqueness at one extreme and linearity at another. So um, when, you, when you ask me, do I see applications of affine types and relevant types? Um, I, I say relevant types tend to fall apart. I think I want strictness um, more often than I want true relevance. I want re relevance as a component of linearity. Uh, no, uh, uniqueness is not ordered. Ordered is something else. Um, uniqueness is um, Dana, I don't remember Dana's last name, uh, wrote a... PhD thesis on the uniqueness types that are used in clean. Hello, the Daggett. Good morning, Lispy. Um, or, I guess it's afternoon, your time. Uh, so the... Oh, well, it's the afternoon, my time. The idea of uniqueness is more about saying something about what has come to pass so far. Ordered is saying that you're not allowed to switch the order of two things in the context. So I'm, I'm going to punt on ordered. There's a whole pile of very, very weak logics that Lambic ex explored way down there um, for ordered logics. And um, yeah, Pierce doesn't talk about uniqueness. You're going to have to look up the papers on clean in order to get some kind of notion of coherent talking uh, discussion about uniqueness. It's a completely different point. And, and Pierce didn't talk about... Pierce didn't talk about... Um, Linear, affine, or relevant. Either that was um, David Walker in the article in Adipal. So you can talk about uniqueness in clean or in Idris, I think. Oh, yeah, Idris has and, some stuff there. Yeah, and um, what's Rust? Was that fine? I, I don't quite remember. Well, Rust has all of this, like, borrowing kind of stuff. Right, but I, I feel like it falls in this... In and now it's saying something about Mercury, but I don't know enough about Mercury off the top of my head to be able to say. Well, it's it's my uh, it's my icon in Discord, so maybe that's what it is. Ah. I think he means the programming language, but okay. <laughs> Probably. 
<laughs> Why Mercury, by the way? Was it just because it was round? Uh, yes, exactly. You got it exactly. Okay. Um, so anyway, so that, that's sort of like the sketch of the lattice that I want. So I want, really want, like, am I like? There's a this direction I sketched the lattice is really terrible. So I'm going to draw this again. So I want like linear and affine and um, some notion of let's just I'll stick with the word relevance, but keep in mind that I'm really interested in strictness. And then let's call this unrestricted. And what I'm interested in, like, now I want something that's relevant and unique. And something down here that's unique. Like, you get this, like, cross product of, like, of two simple lattices that gives me um, the notion of modalities that I really kind of want for talking about programming. And, I, and I've left off ordered. You can throw all that stuff in here and add more dimensions. Um, so... Uh, when I was doing um, my second master's thesis, my advisor, uh, I, I started sketching this like crazy dependent type, type theory with all this substructural logic and stuff like that. And then I started bolting in refinement types and all this. I just threw everything at the at the at the at the wall and tried to see what would stick. And it um, eventually he was like, "Well, it doesn't surprise me that you can add a type system, a feature to a, a crazily complicated type system," um, and get a little bit more functionality. It would be more interesting to him if, if I could remove things from my logic or my, my type system and, um, and still be able to program with it. But basically, the vehicle that I was using to do this is something called display logic. And display logic is a logic by a guy named Newell Belknap, the same guy who invented relevance logic. And it's, it's basically a series of local properties that you can put on each one of the connectives in your logic to prove the admissibility of cut. And I'm way off in the weeds here. Um, the point of it was that um, normally when you go to prove the admissibility of cut, you have to like prove how all n squared of your connectives can commute through each other. So basically the idea of proving the admissibility of cut is that you could prove that anything that you could write with a lemma, you could write without using the lemma. Anything you can write with a function, you could write um, uh, without using functions. Um, it's not an axiom, it's a thing that you prove about your logic. So um, the point of all of this was I started trying to build this crazy type theory. I said, well, let's use Curry-Howard and we'll start with display logic and we'll see what the, the type theory that results out of it was. And the thing is, is you're allowed to basically take connectives out of almost every logic that you're interested in. You can take the connectives out of modal S4 and you can take the modalities and all this kind of stuff. There's a bunch of stuff for putting um, substructural logics on display. All of that stuff works. The problem is, is that not enough of it works together. And not enough of it gives you any sort of way to abstract over things and be parametric in the choice of things. And so um, I built a good chunk of this whole language and I just wasn't smart enough to program in it. Um, and so... That somewhat gives me pause. The other one that thing that gives me pause is that when people turn around and say, "Well, let's just throw linear logic in a linear types into my programming language," a lot of the optimizations that we use today aren't sound in the presence of linear types. Once linear types become a thought you can care about, um, you now have to really worry about things like lambda lifting and lowering um, because they can change the number of uses of a variable. Um, and so, things that were previously just about doing work safety to make sure that you didn't increase the amount of work something was done by lifting something up. Now you have to worry about the um, any additional sharing actually compromising linearity constraints. And so those things are actually really kind of weird to me. Um, another one that, but there is a lot of use to this um, that I see. Like if I look at like an actual like runtime representation of a heap, uniqueness is a recoverable property at like at runtime. Like the uniqueness at the type level is a conservative approximation of uniqueness that you have at a value level. And so if my garbage collector can recover uniqueness information, then I can work more efficiently than my types might allow me. Um, and you can start playing games with, like, if I have a, a value like that lives on the heap, I have a thunk or something like that, it has, a, it has an environment, and it has, like, a pointer to, like, a little computation that is an affine thunk 
that is going to update that's going to compute the final answer. So when it, where this like this thing has a computation that is going to use these values in an affine manner to produce some result. Like there's a there's a interesting chain of consequences of that. Like you can start thinking about um, the thunk as a sort of barrier to I can share this thunk even though this computation has access to all these things because this computation is the only thing that can access the environment. And then it can kind of publish and release this information. Um, you can start talking about um, relevance telling you whether or not you should do the mutation in place or whether you should just chain another computation into the the chain of operations that are going to be done underneath this this point. Um, and each one of these points has like a different set of behaviors and how you want to actually operationally use the thing. Um, and so I think there's a lot of there's a lot to be had for this from a runtime perspective. I think there's um, there's a lot of power in either linear or uniqueness types. I think affine types are kind of necessary because if you see the work that's been doing in um, display logic or not in display logic in um, the linear types proposal that's been coming out of Twig. Um, that's really about affine types because the moment you can throw exceptions in Haskell and we have async exceptions everywhere, then the linear type guarantees go to hell. Um, so we don't actually have a linear types proposal. We really have an affine types proposal that tries to be linear as long as you don't use exceptions. Um, so there, there's a lot of, like, I see use here, 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 here. The unrestricted modality is sort of the base default. Um, and I see some power to, like, being able to do dependency analysis to relevance is the wrong default, but strictness is good. And that like this is this is all stream of consciousness stuff. This is this is basically where I'm where I think about these things or how I think about these things, not uh, very formally. Um, as for display logic, um, display logic is a way to take a bunch of connectives from different logics and throw them into a blender and then say that the thing is a sound logic with admissible cut, with like six local properties on each individual connective. And then you can prove that you don't have to write all the stuff to prove that thing, the like that the stuff you threw in the blender blends. It's like when you go to the like the random Mongolian barbecue place and you grab a bunch of stuff and you throw all the spices in there. Like they're all going to taste okay because they're all drawn from a fairly narrow palette. The Discord link is not working. Um, let's see here. Is it the voice one or the text one that's not working? So GC compute uniqueness in a lazy language. Um, basically, all I'm having is that, um, like, if you start with like the notion of like a one-bit garbage collector, you can actually tweak a garbage collector to recover the uniqueness bit, or like the one-bit reference counting scheme. So you can, you can, um, like, a lot of garbage collection schemes, like you you wind up doing the pointer inversion, and then you come back. So when you've got the pointer inversion, you can know exactly how many pointers there are to the final object. And so during that inversion, you just um, drop the, the link. The link in the panels, I think, is text. Um, I mean, I'm just going to try and test the Discord link and fix it. You've been invited to join. What about the other one? Okay, so it's the voice link in the text. Or, okay, so I'm going to have to do that in the other machine here. Hold on. <laughs> uh, if I flail around with mice. Um, Streamlabs. No, not Streamlabs. Uh, Discord, give me a link. Voice chat. Create an instant invite link, never expire, copy. Uh, I just need to dump this in. Without this thing trying to play my stream. Edit the panel. Paste. Sorry about that. In theory, the voice link should be fixed on um, 
for Discord. All right. If not, follow the text link and then just join the voice channel. All right, where was I? Um, back into Q&A, drawing Q&A. Okay, so did that at all address your concern? Uh, temporal type theory from... Um, so there's a lot of stuff with um, temporal logic. So um, I think that's going to be... That would become a whole... Um, talk in its own. Am I interested in complexity theory at all? I'm very interested in complexity theory. Um, I do a lot of work with um, like all sorts of like fancy uh, succinct data structures and things that have non-obvious uh, non asymptotics. Um, I don't have a lot of um, insight in how to effectively leverage the category theory stuff for reasoning about asymptotic performance, except for using things like Uneda and whatnot in order to shove around asymptotic costs. Let me see if I, 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 I probably missed, uh, I is like the top level theory. Um, yeah, so display logic is just sort of the theory that covers all of these things. Or is is a... It's the closest thing to a logical... Or to a hack in the domain of how do you build, like, a logic. I don't think it's terribly popular among logicians, but I'm not a logician. I started the logic channel on Freenode and then basically just let Dan run it. Thanks, Dan. Is that that's that side pulled the wrong way? There. <sighs> oh, you're not in there either. Okay, so whoever's running it now, I should probably log into the channel and see if it's just become a spam fest. Night a few of the locals to to mod things. So how are we doing on time here? Because, all right, we got like another 15 minutes before Brian gets going. Can run a Slack channel. I think I will skip running a Slack channel. I can't IRC into one anymore. So I have to use it for work, but that's about all I'm using Slack for. Do I think it might be a good idea to have the GC avert evaluated thunks to thunk in order to save memory? Um, I think that's a dangerous proposition in some ways because you need to know how much it costs to get you there. Um, and so you risk changing the amount of work you do. And so I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that in a work safe manner. Do I plan to do these live coding sessions on the regular? Um, the... My goal is to start trying to do these things like every Sunday or on a, a fairly regular Sunday basis. Um, at the moment, it's not going to work out that way because I have, I have too much travel coming up. So like the next two or three weeks, I'm in Australia. So I may be able to stream from down there, but I'm doubting it with the state of Australian hotel internet. Um, I would really like to stream when I'm up at uh, QFBL like with Tony Morris. Um, but it sounds like... Um, Puff and Fresh already did the uh, like some of the Data sixty one stuff on here. I was I was I was originally thinking that it would be kind of cool to try and get um, Tony to do a live stream with me for like an intro like the intro Haskell course that they have. But they have um, like I said, uh, Puff and Fresh has already done it, so that takes some of the pressure off. And then I just don't know how well the how I'd be able to get my whole streaming uh, enough of my streaming set up down there to work. Do you think you might follow like the um, 
the sort of uh, developed over time uh, tutorial that's that Tony has been uh, working on for the past several years. Well, that that was the thought was to do that as a live Twitch stream. You know, see how many non Haskell folks we could get in to do a, a big Haskell Twitch stream of here's an intro to Haskell. Let's go do the whole thing. You know. Um, but I mean, Tony does that as like an eight hour class is like a start, you know, so that could be a, quite the draining exercise. Um, but yeah, I would, I would love to do that. Um, I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be down there for three weeks, but I'm only going to be in Brisbane for like a week of it. So I'm not, or like for five days of it or something like that. So I don't think I'm going to be able to get, um, too much time to bend his ear on the topic. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Maybe you can convince Tony to get as fancy a uh, streaming setup as you have now. Yeah, we'll see. Um, uh, so I, I haven't I haven't really touted this or anything, but um, if anybody here has a um, Amazon Prime subscription or whatever, you can subscribe to one Twitch channel for free. Um, every month. And so if you're interested in, um, like I'm first of all, interested in using this to help defray a little bit of my setup costs. The other thought is that, um, I might start trying to use, um, if I can get things set up nicely, I would like to just start donating some things to like Haskell.org or something like that on a, on a recurring basis. But the other thought is that if you subscribe to the channel that I believe if I, if I can get enough viewers or whatever, I can, if I can make it to Twitch Partner, I think there's an option for me to disable the ad that plays at the beginning for subscribers and whatnot. So there's a thing there. Um, but I know a lot of the Haskell folks aren't Twitch regulars, so um, you you may not well be subscribed to an, another stream. So there's a gift a sub or a, like a sub button up at the top of the the chat. Feel free to like if you're enjoying this, give it a try. Yeah, I don't know the, the full status on Twitch Prime versus whatever. But my I would love to be able to disable as much of the advertisements and stuff as I can. But man, it is kind of hilarious. Now Dan has this little number one badge, which I would totally have given him anyways, but because he's the only person who has uh, successfully used bits in this channel. Um, so that was the administrative. So um, the the idea was I, I, I'm thinking about trying to use. Um, Whatchamacallit? Um, I am thinking about trying to use... Uh, trying to run smaller sessions during the week at some point. Like for... like I've got things like... I gave a I mentioned last time uh, this library that I have for promises. But I've never given a talk on how that library works. And I could probably fill 30 to 45 minutes just talking about how that library works. The spaces of options for how it could proceed and stuff like that. And it would give me a bit of media in some form that I could archive um, about my promises library or about the current state of my discrimination library or something like that. Those kind of things aren't really talked about. So Jason, my, my thought is, uh, my, my first goal is I want to recoup some of my setup costs here. And once I've done that, I... I I'm going to see if it's possible for me to just pass it through directly or what I'll have to, I might have to adjust my tax documents with it. Um, and yes, I should um, do the announcement on discord general chat. I was trying to do that. There was a bot that was supposed to do it and didn't apparently happen. Or as a special action bonus, you get all my streams uh, testing purposes. Yeah, so I apologize for anybody who was turning in during the week as I was sitting here rambling into my microphone going testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Um, but it did at least get us to a fairly stable stream this time, other than the one crash that seems to have happened in the middle for, some, for no reason. Oh, 
Oh. All right. Any other questions? We've got like 10 minutes left before uh, Brian runs off and starts doing Sonic streaming. I was trying to do it with local recordings. I was having trouble um, getting everything. That, like that was how I did the last batch of tests. Uh, Edwin K, how do I get compensated? Um, the uh, subscriptions, I think if you do a Twitch Prime subscription, I think I get two bucks or something like that, 250. Um, I don't know. I, like, I think if, the, if everyone who joined here like did it, I'd, like, it'd be a hundred bucks. Woohoo, you know. <laughs> um, so I'm not, not anticipating it being big finance. Uh, I'm mo more interested in what I can use that for to turn around and... Um, you know, reduce ads or something. I just don't know enough about it. I'm still new to this. I anticipate that I'm going to be a terrible streamer if I do these little side things like, you know, here's me rambling for 45 minutes about, like, a library because I'm going to get, like, 10 people who tune in on the short notice that I'll give them. And a lot of people watching the, the archival videos, if, or some people watching the archival videos. And so in terms of like a monetizing streamer or something like that, I am not going to be ninja. Thank you, stupid Chuck. Is there a reason why non-empty does not have an instance of cons in lens? Yes. Um, because unconts does weird things on the empty case. Yeah, and now, Dan, you're, you're, you've been demoted to number two. You have to give me more bits. Um, <laughs> I, I like this contest. Um, the... So, so what would happen with unconts in lens, if you, if you were to go to unconts through the cons prism, um, you would unconts as long as you weren't at the last element, and the last element would get stuck. Um, at one point in time, the... Lens library was like, I think the cons class had six parameters so that you could use it for things like H lists and um, it could properly handle some of the non empty cases like non empty, unconsing will always succeed. Um, consing will always succeed. Like you can get it as an ISO. And that, at that point in time, it actually makes sense. But as a prism, it, it doesn't make sense. Switch out of my scribbles here. Just the Q and A. There we go. And yeah, I I uh, admit, stupid Chuck, that I do tend to pitch. Um, my my general goal is to make it so that the like eighty percent of the audience gets a good chunk of stuff out of it, and then like twenty percent of it is a stretch goal for people. Do I think the Profunctor implementation of lenses is better than the others? Ooh, there, there's... Um, so, in many ways, yes. Um, I think the encoding that we have in Haskell that I use in the lens library is maybe the best for Haskell in the sense of I don't think I could get a... like A pure Profunctor encoding of lenses in Haskell would not be um, as widely adopted as the existing lens library. And so... 
Um, I've kind of pushed in that direction, like in the direction of using the Van Larhoven encoding for um, for lenses and traversals and whatnot in Haskell because it means that third parties can supply lenses without incurring any dependencies. Like lenses and traversals are the common things that people supply. Um, for PureScript, when we went to go build, the, they had a lens library already. When we went to go do a, um, uh, like I pointed out that it was possible to just drop in ProFunctor lenses because they didn't have the huge body of existing code and they're a little more um, on board with doing lots of little dependencies. Um, and so that works pretty well for them. Up until recently, we didn't really think it was possible to do the index lens stuff properly with pure, uh, with the pure ProFunctor encoding, but it does look like with Undecidable Superclasses that I have a way. I gave a... I made a comment on Reddit a year ago that gave the solution. I've forgotten it. But there is a trick using undecidable superclasses. So the last major barrier to using ProFunctor um, lenses is gone. Would I use ProFunctors in, in production? Sure. Um, I, or I, we used ProFunctor lenses all over the place at uh, S&P. Um, all of our code for Ermine. Uh, the front end of it was all written in PureScript, and that stuff used the ProFunctor lens encoding all over the place. Um, so I, the the main reason I, I like ProFunctor lenses for teaching, like uh, like uh, Brian does here, as he mentioned in the chat, um, the uh, the Van Larhoven encoding is really just because it's something I can get adoption for. And uh, thank you, Edmund Cape. By the way, are the random animation things distracting? I threw them in to, as a test to see if I could actually... Because it's the only way I can really notice that these things are happening. Um, so yeah, so I w I'm not in a hurry to turn around and embrace pure uh, ProFunctor lenses for Haskell, uh, mainly because it would just fragment the lens ecosystem further. And there's enough, you know, reasonable lens, small lens, lens without all the stuff I'm not using today, lens libraries that people have. I tried to drop the volume as much as I could. And yeah, Dan, I didn't uh, get around to putting laser beams behind me. I just have the uh, the random field of dust. And LENS is the one I, I do. Um, lens is uh, this Matt Farkas Dyke guy. Oh, the one behind my head? Yeah. They're buried all over the place, I think, in here. I, I, I admit I overdid it because I was just playing around with fiddly with particle effects and stuff because, yeah, got bored. So what new uh, stream features can we look forward to next week, Ed? I have no idea. Um, next week? Camera? <laughs> well, I had the second camera. It was physically here, and so... I was uh, talking with Dan and a couple other people on the IRC chat and uh, on IRC, and we were just, um, and they were making fun of me. And I said, "Oh, I'm going to go off and, and set up a second camera for this, because I couldn't uh, draw last time." And I realized I had the mic or I had the camera. Uh, 
All right, how are we doing on on time here? Uh, Brian, are you going to start up? I think we have run to your start time as I understand it. Oh, good. Um, Russell, that sounds like a good plan. Um, I think I'm going to need to try and structure this a little bit more, I think. Uh, like, this session was good as a good general Q&A, get a, getting a lot of this stuff out, out in the open. Um, I think next time we'll probably do more of a programming session and then um, maybe do the one after that as a tutorial. I don't know the, the timing on when the next session will be. I'm going to have to actually work that up. And, um, yeah, next week I'm in Australia, so I probably won't be... Um, streaming anything at the end of the week. I might be able to shoehorn in uh, like a quick thing, like I mentioned about the Promises Library or something like that, sometime during the week on an almost impromptu basis. Um, if I'm streaming during the week, it's almost going to be even money whether or not I'm fiddling with my setup or actually giving a stream. And uh, thank you all. And um, I am going to raid Puffin Fresh here. Feel free to hang out with him. And uh, actually, let me roll my, my credits. Ah.